It's Wednesday morning and this is a train pulling into Airdrie Station. For a few dismal decades, this was a terminus. Before someone had the bright idea of reopening it to through trains towards Bathgate and Edinburgh. Fortunately for Airdrie though, some trains still give up when they get this far, so some poor stragglers, such as myself, get unleashed to spend their not-so-hard-earned cash in the town. Hold tight, because this is bound to be a whistle-stop trip that neither they nor I will ever forget. Primarily because I'm recording it for posterity, as this week's episode of Forgotten Town. Airdrie, Lanarkshire. Population 37,410. Rank number 287. Airdrie today is battling against the perennial enemy of any town in this part of the world, attempting to look its best for the casual visitor. To wit, the weather. Unsurprisingly today, it is tree with perma drizzle and doesn't really encourage you to hang around and see the sights. So, uh, time for a pint. The best. There we go. So as I settle in with a pint of the Bellhaven Best, with some disappointing daytime television in the background, it's time to fill you in on a few pearls of wisdom I've unearthed about this place, without even bothering to take a proper look around. First, it's worth pointing out that along with last week's settlement of Coatbridge and their various constituent suburbs, Airdrie forms the more or less continuous conurbation of Monklands. While informed politicos amongst the audience may recognise that as the former Westminster constituency of such luminaries as the late John Smith and Baroness Liddell of Coaldyke. However, it's unlikely that they'd have got much of a look in prior to the Scottish Reform Act of 1832. I've been reading in some book or other that the the price of enfranchisement in the first town council elections was three guineas, and pretty much no other qualification. Whilst that might have been bad news for local workers, one lucky lad, John Mackay, had the fee paid by his father and enjoyed the dubious honour of voting in his first election, age nine. So whilst the lack of age restriction might have inspired certain Holyrood policies of more recent times, the cash requirements probably didn't, and didn't do much to quell disquiet amongst impoverished local weavers. And indeed, employees of this important local industry did much to get the Scottish insurrection, or radical war, if you're that way inclined, of 1820 off the ground. It may have been unsuccessful at the time, but it's fair to say it wasn't the end of organised labour north of the border. Cheers. Back at the rain-spattered central shopping area of Airdrie, which actually looks like quite a solid town, and probably quite a busy and prosperous one. The beer wasn't all they had hoped for at the uh, Treasury pub, but it served its purpose. Gave me an opportunity to rest my flagging limbs whilst uh, killing a wee bit of time before the next train station on to Armadale. And so as we leave my slightly windswept self to wend my way back to the station, it's time for some brief residual knowledge transfer. Firstly, Airdrie is the home of Scotland's first public library, partly funded by noted philanthropist and bookworm Andrew Carnegie. And what's even more impressive is that it also houses Airdrie Public Observatory. Both continue to be fully operational. Secondly, you can find Aaron View here, a seminal building designed by Alexander Greek Thompson. And unlike one or two of his under-maintained Glaswegian churches, this place is still a thriving concern, albeit now divided into flats. Given that one of them's currently on the markets, you can even take a virtual tour on right move. And finally, the town is home to Erdrionians Football Club, who've won both cup and league, gone bust, and re-emerged from their debt-ridden mess to the dizzying heights of the Scottish second tier, in spite of the Lord Lion King of Arms declaring their crest to be illegal. Airdrie, but I've never been to Armadale, Linlithgowshire, population 12.